Hi there, everybody. Welcome to another Chem Complete lecture in the carboxylic acid derivative series. And in today's lecture, I am going to take a brief look at the anhydride structure. So this is one of the carboxylic acid derivatives. It is less reactive than the acyl chlorides, but it is more reactive than esters and amides. So that is what we will be taking a look at today on the channel coming up right now. Thank you so much for choosing Chem Complete for your lecture needs today. And anything you might need is down in the description box. So if you are interested in getting free resources, you can go to chemcomplete.com. There's plenty of things that we have posted over there in order to help you with your studies. There's also more detailed advanced guides for purchase for difficult subjects to help give you a walkthrough and it supports the channel. They're very affordable. Now let's go ahead and get started with carboxylic acid derivatives and anhydrides specifically. So the anhydride structure is going to take the general format of some sort of hydrocarbon group, a carbonyl, an oxygen, another carbonyl, and then another R group. So the key here in terms of the reactivity is this portionality right here. So the fact that you are going to kick this group off and when it leaves, you will have something that is going to be resonance stabilized. So you could have something coming in here. You can kick off this group and what's left behind is this oxygen anion and the oxygen anion will get the benefit of resonance stabilization in solution, which is why it makes a pretty decent leaving group. Not as good as the chlorine when we were talking about acyl chlorides in the previous lecture, but this is still a very reactive species because of this effective leaving group due to the resonance stabilization. So that is the structure of anhydride. Now, the most common non-cyclic anhydride is acetic anhydride, and it is by far the one that is used the most in organic chemistry reactions. So acetic anhydride would just have the CH3 group right here. Acetic anhydride is relatively simple to make compared to a lot of other open chain anhydrides. And so you're going to see it far more often and in a lot more examples, uh, especially if you're being more practical in a laboratory setting. Okay. So how do we actually form anhydrides? There's two ways that this can be done. So the first way is through dehydration. This is a more difficult pathway, but it is still possible. So this is going to take two carboxylic acids, and we can just stick with the acetic acid example here to make things easy. So you'll have two equivalents of this, and I'm actually going to draw it out just so that it makes a bit more sense as I'm explaining it here. Okay, and I'm going to put this one in a reverse setting here. So if I take a look at this, if I have two equivalents of the acetic anhydride and I apply heat, that's really the only thing you need for this reaction. The idea is that you can dehydrate by removing one of the OH groups and another hydrogen from this. And so this one will join up right with this carbonyl. And as a result, you're basically going to have a loss of water and with the loss of water, you will get an anhydride that's going to come out of this process. Okay? This can be relatively difficult to drive forward, and anhydrides themselves are reactive. So if you don't fully drive the water away and out of the solution, anhydrides, when they are exposed to water, can go right back to being a carboxylic acid. So you have to realize that there is going to need to be a driving force that removes the water from that acetic anhydride or whatever anhydride you might be forming. Okay, now the other option is to tap into the acyl chloride. So if you look back in the previous lecture on acyl chlorides, they are the most reactive of the different carboxylic acid derivatives, which means all the other derivatives can be made from acyl chlorides. So in this case, we can make an anhydride from an acyl chloride. So what we would do is we would utilize some sort of a carboxylic acid, and the carboxylic acid, the first thing that we would want to do is turn it into a better nucleophile. 
And so we could accomplish this by using something along the lines of, let's just say sodium hydroxide, right? Some sort of a base. And then in the second step, after we have the anions formed, we could expose it to a acyl chloride of choice. Okay, so what would happen here is that after this deprotonates, you would end up with this nucleophile. And then you would expose this nucleophile to the acyl chloride. So when we've got the acyl chloride here, the chlorine group is going to leave, right, as the oxygen would come in here. So technically, this would come up briefly, this would leave. Okay, and then the result that you would get in this case would be the portionality from the carboxylic acid. And then you would have the portionality that came from the acyl chloride and you now have an anhydride that you've made using this technique. Okay, this would be more reactive than the dehydration uh, because you're using that acyl chloride and there's going to be less chance for the reversibility uh, once the acyl chloride is formed. You're not going to reform acyl chlorides very readily because of how reactive they are. They are more reactive than the anhydride. So technically speaking, the anhydride would be a more stable product. We would expect it to kind of just exist in solution for a longer period of time than the acyl chloride would. Okay, now for the anhydride reactions, we've really covered this in the acyl chloride series uh, because they're going to be so similar in terms of reactivity. They're not that unique compared to acyl chlorides. Now, when we get to esters, that'll be different. Esters do have some more unique reactions like saponification. Okay, so for the anhydride reactions, there's really only three major ones that you would want to know. So the first one is that if you have an anhydride, and we mentioned this just a minute ago, if you expose that anhydride to water, the anhydride will readily break down and will give you back the corresponding carboxylic acid, right? So as long as I've got water present here, then I can get the carboxylic acid back in return. Okay, number two would be that we can make esters out of this. So if you wanted to, you could utilize the anhydride and then you could expose it to some sort of a alkoxide ion for the relative ester that you're looking for plus its corresponding alcohol so to keep things simple let's say that we would use sodium methoxide and then we would also couple that with methanol as a solvent to pair with that and so what you would end up with in this case if you expose the anhydride to this would be the corresponding ester so that you'd get that OCH3 group that's taking the place of the second half of the anhydride and now you have an ester okay and the last one here would be the amide so for the amide you could use the anhydride here and then you're going to need to use some sort of an amine group now when it comes to the amine groups you could utilize just uh, simply NH3 or you could use sort of like a uh, what do you call it? sodium amide like NaNH2 or you could use a primary or secondary amine okay so in this case let's go ahead and work with a primary amine just to show this uh, amide that's going to result here so again in the sake of keeping things simple let's just use methylamine CH3 NH2 and with methylamine what we would end up with is this nitrogen would come in it would attack the carbonyl and it would displace the leaving chunk that is resonance stabilized and so you would get a resulting amide that would look as the following so you'd have the first portionality from your anhydride and then you would have in this case n h ch3 and you have an amide as your final result there Okay, so that pretty much covers anhydrides. Those are the main reactions that you would have. We discussed how you can make them through dehydration and through the use of acyl chlorides, the more reactive of the 
carboxylic acid derivatives, and we took a look at their general structure and discussed why they are reactive compared to some of the others that we see in the derivative list. So I'm just going to remind you one more time, if you check the description box down below, chemcomplete.com, there's free resources for you guys over there if you're struggling, as well as some guides that are very affordable only for a couple dollars to help support the channel. And as always, the best way that you support the channel is subscribing, staying up to date, and using chemcomplete as your resource for learning during your chemistry time. So thank you so much for learning with me. Give the video a like if it was helpful, and I will see everybody in the next lecture.